Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm an orthopedic surgery PA here in Toronto. Uh, my name is Andrew Lim. I'm the physician assistant for the Division of Orthopedic Surgery here at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. It's located in Toronto and I work as part of the orthopedic trauma team. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did before you became a PA? Uh, so prior to PA school in general, um, I, I studied uh, kinesiology at the University of Guelph Humber. Uh, it's where I kind of found my passion for anatomy physiology and I wanted to apply that uh, more into a clinical practice setting. So previously I was looking into uh, becoming an uh, exercise physiologist um, and just along the way I kind of fell in love with orthopedics as a whole and started looking around for other opportunities to kind of continue that passion. So I found the physician assistant program um, actually more through word of mouth from a family member who suggested a physician assistant as a role because she was a nurse working in the United States, very well established there, and I started looking more into it and ever since then it just kind of fell into place. And were there other careers that you were considering apart from exercise physiologist? Yeah, actually, so I was looking into both occupational therapy and physiotherapy. So in kinesiology in itself, um, a lot of, at least from my experience with my colleagues, is that it is a, a fairly smooth transition over to one of those two fields. Um, I was looking into it, but I wasn't sure whether or not it was something that really would have held my interest for a long period of time. I think I wanted something that was a little bit more broader in scope and had a little bit more opportunities for development in the future. Do you ever consider the MD route? I did previously. Um, I felt that you know it's it's definitely it was definitely an option at the time but the more I thought about it the more I thought that I wanted to start working as soon as possible and in a way it, it kind of did detract me from that MD route just because going through medical school going through residency fellowship and applying for a full-time position you know it, it didn't seem as appealing to me at the time and of course you know I, I just found that something like the physician assistant route was just a bit more you know, specific to what I wanted at the time and going forward I think that I made the right choice. Okay and just a general overview what are some um, things that you enjoy about being a PA? Uh, a PA as a profession actually it's it's really interesting because it is a very new and exciting position uh, a lot of people you know and I speak with a lot of my physician assistant colleagues in the United States even now it's uh, it's very new in the States and especially here in Canada it's definitely something that I really enjoy being part of something new, something innovative, and something that is definitely growing. And you know, here at the CAPA conference, I, I definitely see just how much our profession has changed. Um, it's definitely something that has opened a lot of opportunities for me, not just in a clinical setting, but also in other settings, in the hospital, as well as just uh, in teaching. Okay. And uh, where did you go to PA school, and when did you graduate? I went to the uh, university, McMaster University rather, uh, physician assistant program, uh, enrolled in 2014 and graduated in 2016. Um, I, I looked into the different schools and I found the McMaster just because their program in itself had a very uh, different style of teaching with PBL, uh, was a little bit more appealing to me because in my undergrad I found that that was um, something that I already kind of fostered on my own, just problem-based learning, kind of case-based approach. And did you know where you wanted to work after being done PA school? I did actually. So uh, fortunately for me, I did uh, meet the right people during my clerkship years. I always um, approach a clerkship or just any sort of clinical rotation as almost like an extended job interview. And so I started to ask around and started to kind of you know, figure out whether or not the physician that I was working with was interested in hiring a PA. And that led to opportunities to meeting someone from uh, the Sunnybrook um, Orthopedic Surgery Unit that uh, was actually looking actively for a physician assistant. And everything just kind of fell into place once I uh, applied for an internship there. And I, and I was able to apply for the position later on that year after my graduation and everything just worked out. We personally had you as a student and we um, well, who tells me that you were excellent? So what were um, some key attitudes, behaviors, or approach that you had to clerkship, making sure you showed up and made a good impression? I think um, a lot of what I did, not just in the clinical rotation itself, but my approach to you know, getting into PA school, 
succeeding, a lot, a lot of it has to do with exuding confidence and whether or not you really do have that confidence innate. Um, I think that confidence, you know, in many ways will uh, personify that uh, professionalism as well as competence. And I think that once you make other people feel confident in your abilities and think that, hey, this person, you know, he seems like he knows what he's doing, or at the very least he's trying and he's putting that, that effort, I think it really makes everyone a bit more comfortable working with you and that opens up a lot more opportunities for education. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel PA school prepared you for your work as a PA? I think in many ways, um, I mean, I can only speak f on behalf of the Physician Assistant Program at Master University, but I find that there was a very uh, strong emphasis on the collaborative effort with small group-based learning, and a lot of that had to do with uh, having these cases, um, presenting it to your colleagues, and really kind of talking through it as if it was a real-life patient, and what you would do in that scenario. and. Uh, a lot of back and forth, and it definitely did help, you know, foster both that communication piece as well as uh, show a little bit more leadership uh, in that you're able to direct as well as to follow. Mm -hmm. And um, once you graduated, what was your process for finding a job? Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be able to secure my position through the Career Start program, uh, the fund that was uh, set up for a lot of the new grads uh, in my year. And I, like most other of my colleagues in my year, we started looking at the different opportunities that opened up uh, when the time came, and we started applying for the things that really interested us the most. Um, I was fortunate in that I did do a clinical rotation with the orthopedic surgery group over at Sunnybrook, and so they were very familiar with me, and just kind of going back, you know, trying to, you know, exude that same confidence in my application, in my resume, and making sure that um, this is something that you know, really did resonate with them as well. And um, going through multiple different applications because you never really want to subject yourself to just one, especially because there are so many different opportunities available. And there are a lot of great positions open in my year. And it just turns out that the one place I really did fall in love with, you know, I guess felt the same way about me. Um, so for, for those that aren't familiar, uh, how would you describe or define um, the specialty of orthopedic surgery? So orthopedic surgery is, uh, in many ways, one of those specialties that often will get a bad rap because I find that uh, a lot of the different fields will have this notion of what orthopedic surgery is. Oh, these are guys who just fix bones. That's all they do. Whereas it's actually a little bit more complex than that. And I find that um, living it, I, I've really enjoyed just and appreciated just how complex different things are. I mean, there is a lot of medicine involved, especially in my role because I do work with a lot of the inpatients looking after their acute uh, issues as well as the post-operative complications. There is the more technical side of things, making sure that you're able to um, help out either in the OR setting or in the inpatient trauma setting wherein you have these consults coming in, you're admitting them, making sure that they have all their medications ordered, making sure that they have you know, everything they need to succeed prior to the surgery. And there's a lot of uh, intricacies to it that I never really got to appreciate until after I started working and living it. And do you work um, in one subspecialty or with one physician, or how does it, how does it work? So my group is a little bit different. Um, I guess in many ways it's very similar to other hospital groups in the sense that there are going to be multiple surgeons. In my, my institution, we have 16 orthopedic surgeons. Um, and uh, for spine surgeons. And I work with, you know, to varying degrees, all of these surgeons and help out with their patients. Um, they, they will have different specialties or areas of, of expertise. Uh, in particular, I work with a few specialists who, who look into soft tissue injuries and the, and the shoulder. And we also have the other specialties that are exclusive to foot and ankle. And so it's a little bit of everything. Okay, do you have a role in the OR? I don't actually. So previously, in, especially during my clerkship in my first introductory uh, few months in my position, uh, it, I think it was very important for me to get that, that exposure in the OR because, of course, you know, when you're following these patients postoperatively, it does help to know exactly what they did in the OR so you can explain to the patient and their family what happened. Uh, following that, um, as with all roles in the PA profession, uh, you will find that uh, things will transition, you will have opportunities to improve care in other areas, and there might be more of a need. 
And in the case of a teaching hospital in a large downtown Toronto uh, you know, facility, it's, it was very important for them to focus on the inpatient care aspect. And uh, in many ways, it frees up the opportunities for the, the trainees, both resident physicians and the fellows, to, to focus on the surgical side of things. Um, so it really seemed like it, it really changed over time. Can you describe what you do in inpatient and ward management? Yeah, so uh, generally speaking, my day will start out with uh, touching base with the uh, team leaders or the charge nurses in each unit that I work with. Uh, whenever I have patients around, I'll chat with them, see if there are any concerns overnight with patients or if there's anything I can do to help facilitate their care and uh, their eventual discharge plan. Um, a lot of the times I will actually speak with the nursing staff themselves and say, hey, is there anything I can help out with? Or actually more often than not, they will come to me and say, hey, this patient has this medication that's ordered. I was wondering if you could clarify this or if you can update the family. And so a lot of my days will be um, held either chatting with the nursing staff, the patients, their families, or the members of the allied health team. So what impact does having a PA in the inpatient ward have on staff, on patients, on nursing? I think um, for the staff um, perspective, I, I think it really makes a huge difference in terms of improving patient care, both in a patient flow setting, making sure that we're able to um, meet these patients, uh, care for them, and help facilitate this, their discharge in a fairly timely manner. Uh, from the, per the patient perspective, I found that I've had a lot of great feedback because um, it's really tough for the resident physicians to be able to spend as much time as they can because they do have other duties and responsibilities, not just to that patient, but to all other patients. And that frees up the opportunity for me to step in and uh, take a little bit more time to go over the patient and their surgery. It gives the patient a little bit more of uh, satisfaction in knowing what has been done and gives them that confidence that, hey, this person is looking out for me. And so I'm, I'm in a good place. I'm happy to kind of uh, carry on with my care. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what you do for uh, call or consults? So I also take consults uh, for the emergency department, both through the outpatient emergency setting as well as with the uh, traumas that we come in, that come into our hospital. And um, both the approaches are, are a little bit different um, for both of them. Of course, with the traumas, it's a, more of a higher acuity setting. So we will have patients who come in uh, through EMS or orange and with very large, often multiply injured um, patients. Um, and we kind of facilitate that uh, ATLS protocol, making sure that I, as part of the orthopedic surgery group, assist and help out with assessing the patient, making sure that we identify these orthopedic issues as soon as possible and temporizing them or treating them right away. And the uh, in the outpatient consult uh, aspect of it in the emergency department, it's a lot more of uh, trying to navigate with the emergency physicians, see, hey, is this a, something that needs to be addressed as an inpatient in hospital? Is this something that needs to be admitted? This is something that can be referred out. Um, and we help, uh, we work closely with the emergency physicians to kind of help them out. Uh, luckily, we also have the um, expertise of other services so we can kind of collaborate and figure out what is the best disposition plan for the patient. And luckily we also have um, anesthesiologists who help facilitate um, care in terms of uh, providing anesthetics for reductions of shoulders and wrists and elbows, things that uh, might need a little bit more expertise. So what are some um, common conditions you get called down for and what procedures do you do in those instances? Um, as with uh, any aging population, we will have a lot of consultations, uh, essentially they're direct admissions for the hip fracture population as well as the um, insufficiency fractures or the uh, uh, pubic rami fractures that come in. So these pelvic fractures definitely, uh, these are the patients who oftentimes so we try to mobilize, get them going and hopefully to home, but oftentimes we will admit. Uh, fairly common are the more complex uh, wrist fractures or um, ankle fractures that need a little bit of extra help with reduction. And you get you know, the, a couple of the, um, the weird and wonderful. So sometimes you, know, you come in expecting a, a normal shoulder uh, that's been dislocated, but all of a sudden you have both a fracture and a dislocation. And it's a bit of a different dislocation. It's an inferior one or whatnot. And it's very interesting because I almost feel that there's so many different orthopedic issues that arise and we get called down to so many that 
the weird and wonderful suddenly becomes routine. And the things that you read about in textbooks are actually there in front of you. So it's very, it's very satisfying. So apart from the fracture dislocation of a shoulder, what are some other uh, weird and interesting uh, reductions that you've done? Um, so it, this actually occurred fairly recently in the Toronto Bay. We had a patient who unfortunately was involved in an accident where he had his entire foot uh, rolled over by, I think it was an 18-wheeler. And so he actually had uh, what seemed like a fairly innocent injury at the time on initial clinical examination. He just had a very swollen foot. We just had to take some x-rays and it turned out that the uh, proximal interphalangeal joints for D1 to 5 on his right foot were all dislocated one over. So it looked like they were in the right position but just one over. So D1 was where D2 is and etc. And so it was interesting because I've never had to just kind of pop each and every single one into position um, it wasn't very challenging or whatnot, but I, I did find it was interesting. And um, you do these reductions yourself? I do. I do them with the assistance of the anesthesiologist or uh, trauma team leader uh, who will assist with facilitating anesthetic. Um, and oftentimes I will not be the only one there from the orthopedic group. I will often be uh, playing backup for the uh, first year or second year residents. Um, but I found that over the years, uh, as I start to grow into this position and feel more confident, confident in my abilities, um, I do a lot more teaching and the first years and second years will come to me and say, I've never done this reduction, can you show me how or can you do this with me? And it's always been a great experience for the both of us. Are you involved in fracture clinic or other outpatient settings? Yeah, so... Um, my role has been defined more as a kind of a, almost like a triage setting wherein my priority has always been to addressing the acute patient care concerns as well as the traumas that kind of tie uh, hand in hand. And then as we kind of fall down the al algorithm for the less acute things that I try to manage, um, you know, I try to tidy everything up and when I find that um, you know, everyone is all settled in, everyone has a plan, or there's really nothing else that's pending, then I'll kind of uh, wander my way down to the fracture clinic and see if there's anything I can help out with. Oftentimes, um, I'll be asked to come into a fracture clinic, especially when we're shorthanded residents, and so long as it doesn't interfere with the rest of my duties in clinical practice, I'm happy to see patients uh, both in the fracture clinic as well as in our consultation clinic uh, just next door. And what are some of the procedures uh, that you do in fracture clinic? So a lot of it um, has to do with uh, helping with reductions and re-reductions. We will often have patients who come in to our fracture clinic uh, from either from emergency or some other facility that um, have reductions that maybe uh, need to be redone or revised to an extent, uh, especially because uh, part of our assessment is to also take down everything. And so while it, they may have had a great reduction, everything looked good, unfortunately sometimes we needed to take everything down just to make sure that there was nothing else that was missing um, or that we needed to collect more information and then we'd have to redo it. And I'd be assisting with the orthopedic technicians, helping them to uh, both set as well as uh, to apply these casts and splints. So can you talk a little bit more about your role with uh, teaching with some of the residents or even some of the fellows? Yeah, so initially I, I was more um, on the outskirts of things. I was trying to take as much as I can in, especially as I transitioned from school to being in the job force. And I found that I wasn't really doing a whole lot in terms of teaching. But once you start to build a routine, once you start to um, have this pattern recognition, you identify these injuries a lot quicker, that's when you can start contributing more to the round sessions where you're able to take cases and, and speak and just kind of identify and kind of work through it uh, with the residents. And then over time, uh, I've been uh, taking that opportunity to, to lead some of these sessions and, and help out and provide that teaching as part of kind of giving back to what I got initially. So you work in a lot of different areas. Um, I do. Is it one area one day a week or just depending on need? Like what does a typical week look like for you? Uh, so generally every day is about the same in the sense that I will float around and so what I try to do is I touch base with the nursing staff uh, for, for the two main units that I work primarily in. So for the orthopedic unit on D5 as well as the trauma unit on C5 
and uh, depending on what we discussed in Hanover that morning, I might wander over to the emergency to address something or um, the critical care unit. But uh, oftentimes it'll be in those areas and that's where I kind of follow along and see, make sure that all the patients that I'm responsible for um, have you know, all their blood work updated and have been seen by either myself or one of the orthopedic residents and have a plan set in place because as part of a large hospital, you want to facilitate that discharge as soon as you can, uh, just for safe, timely, and you know, for bed space issues. And you were the first PA that works uh, in orthopedic surgery in Sunnybrook, mm -hmm. so how did they know how to use you or where, for you, where were you supposed to spend your time? So I was lucky in the sense that I did have uh, some mentors and physicians who already had a vision of what they wanted. They, they identified that there was a need for a physician assistant or a, a, a mid-level care provider to extend the role of a physician, um, particularly in areas for inpatient management as well as a, a essentially a continuity care person, someone who's able to switch or to kind of carry over from block to block for the residents and get everyone up to speed. And it seemed like there was something already in the works. I just helped to uh, foster that and really develop it as, as time went on because they found that maybe there wasn't as much emphasis placed on this area of uh, their unit that they should have placed more. And I took it upon myself to, to kind of uh, fill in all those, those gaps. Yeah, PAs are all about sort of filling the need. Um, and so how do you, is there any formal way that you track the way that PAs are having impact on the service? So initially, especially during my year-end performance review, I took it upon myself to have some quantitative data, to, something to kind of show how much of an impact it is to have a PA on board. Unfortunately, the data that we did come up with, it was very hard to, to really just pin it down to that one factor because everything is variable. Uh, what I initially wanted to do was to uh, collect the data for the past three years of uh, how like the percentage of patients who uh, were discharged below their expected length of stay, their B-loss. And I compared that to my year and how that differed. And while there was a bit of a difference for sure, uh, of course, you know, having such a very limited uh, sample you know, definitely, it, didn't, it was very underpowered. And so while it did look good on paper, it also, at the same time, wasn't uh, as, uh, as useful as I would have liked. Uh, what we did instead was uh, we did a lot of user feedback and surveys and trying to collect as much information from other people and what their thoughts are on my role and how they felt I was doing and how much I was contributing to the division as a whole. How were you oriented to the service when you first started, or were you just seeing patients hitting the ground running? I think because in a hospital setting, one of the major areas of focus was to develop my medical directives as soon as possible. I had more of what was considered like a probation type period where I was trying to learn as much as I can and knowing that my, my scope was very limited because I wasn't able to order medications or use tests. I found that the best way for me to develop my skills early on was to attend lots of clinics and to make myself more of a presence. So initially the nursing staff uh, on my units weren't really familiar with the PA. I was the first one on that unit. And so I started working with them a little bit more, chatting with them and getting a sense of um, where they felt the need was for a mid-level care provider. And I was able to kind of build that trust over time. And once I get my medical directives in, it just was very seamless from there. And can you, for those that do not know, what are medical directives and how does that enable you to practice? So medical directives are essentially um, advanced directives that are set in place uh, through the agreement of both the uh, one who implements the order of a physician as well as the physician themselves. Essentially it's a document that will outline the things that I can, cannot do uh, with or without supervision and uh, it's agreed upon by myself and the supervising physician and I found that this is something that definitely will evolve over time. While you do have one set of directives early on, uh, there, oftentimes the directives will either expand significantly or will narrow down a little bit uh, just to, to fill in the need for the, uh, the role. And do you prescribe medications? I do. 
So uh, I do prescribe medications. Um, the exceptions would be, of course, the uh, uh, scheduled uh, uh, banned substances, so the opioid narcotics, benzodiazepines. Um, generally speaking, it's I have a lot of uh, leeway in the amount of uh, prescribing power I have. But of course, in making sure that I keep in mind that these are prescriptions that are meant to help the patient and that fall within the same scope of practice as my supervising physician. What can an orthopedic surgeon or service expect if they're going to be adding a PA to the service? I guess it kind of depends on where they feel the best place would be for a physician assistant to, to really practice. Is it more of an outpatient setting or inpatient setting? Because that'll kind of dictate just um, you know the, the different roles and the expectations and how much kind of uh, compensation they can get. Because I find that an inpatient setting, it's not so much there to, to make money and it's not there to help recoup the losses because a, a PA can be expensive for sure. The development and the training that goes into it. Um, and so they need to have that mindset that I want to hire an inpatient PA solely for providing my patients with better access to care or for to have them um, be involved in the care of the patient because you know I, I need some help in this area. Whereas in the outpatient setting, you know they, they will still have that mindset of I want to have more access to my patients, I want more people to be seen, but there's also a little bit of incentive behind that because they're able to bill for those consultations and assessments. Yeah. Now you've met a lot of PAs across the United States and a few here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Do they all have the same uh, scope of practice or job responsibilities that you do? I find that in, in chatting with some of the uh, orthopedic physician assistants in the United States, they actually do have a very broad scope of practice, actually more so than myself at times. And I find myself very fortunate in my role here in Canada because to my extent, or to my knowledge, it is definitely unique. Um, the ability for me to float around and, and help out, uh, not just in the uh, inpatient units, but also in the outpatient setting has been excellent for, for myself. And I think it's unique, although I have worked with an ortho physician assistant who has a very similar role over in Ottawa. What do you enjoy about ortho? Like what, what gets you excited in the morning when you wake up and what makes you passionate about it? It has to be the traumas. I, uh, you know, as, as bad as it sounds, I, I do enjoy these multi-system traumas that come in because it, it adds to that complexity of the, the case and being able to see a patient coming in with all these injuries and I'm trying to problem solve and figure out you know, how, how can I help this patient as quickly as possible and make sure that they have the best possible outcome. And I think uh, a lot of that um, really does resonate with me. In orthopedics in itself, I think it's a very um, satisfying in the sense that you do get that instant gratification of, hey, this bone is sticking out of the skin and you put it back and all of a sudden the pain is improved the patient feels better, and even though they're still going for OR, at least they are in a better position than when they first came in. And it's that sort of feeling that you can't really, you know, get anywhere else. And what are some of the challenges with ortho? I think with orthopedic surgery in general, the, the challenges mainly lie in the scope of practice and the role clarity, because of course you also want to work with your, your colleagues, with your physicians, and with your resident physicians in particular. Um, and sometimes it, it makes it a little bit tough when they have never worked with a physician assistant before and they're not sure as to what your scope is and how you're able to help them. And in many ways they are so unsure that they either take everything upon themselves and it makes their life you know, quite harder or they feel that they can delegate anything and everything to me, which you know, of course makes my life harder and also takes away from, from them because they don't know how to fully utilize a PA. And I think this is something that is actually a, a skill that needs to be developed, being able to work in tandem with another colleague. And I think that it's something that, you know, with every block that comes in, you can run into these challenges. Would you say that working with a PA is very similar to working with a resident, or are there certain differences? I think that there's a lot of similarities, especially because uh, having both been trained in the medical model, I think that definitely the, f the mindset is very similar, the approach to patient care is very similar. 
I think that uh, once you start to develop a better sense of what a physician assistant does, then you'll be able to appreciate the differences and just the, not necessarily the limitations, but definitely the things that will set the two apart. And I think the, the surgeons that I work with have been very good at kind of identifying what is something that the resident physician should be managing and what should the physician assistant be managing. Mm -hmm. And the PAMD uh, relationship is something that's very unique and I think you've been fortunate to have such great mentors. So mm -hmm. um, what are attributes of a good physician that would work well with a PA? I think communication has always been the number one thing to keep in mind because you should be in a position wherein you, you treat each other like colleagues and even though there is that kind of hierarchy with the supervising role, the physicians that I work with have fortunately been very open in communicating with me and they, they want my opinion on things and they really want to engage me as much like, as they can. And I think that's been a, a great way to, to grow that level of comfort and to have that literal clarity and going forward, I think that is very important to, to foster that because once you lose that communication piece, that's when things start to go awry and that's when things start getting missed and that's when patient care becomes affected. And um, how do you stay on top of uh, current topics or uh, emerging treatments in ortho? So luckily the physician group that I work with, they're very happy in continuing education. They're huge proponents of it, having uh, been facilitators in courses and teaching themselves. Um, so they really advocate for me to enroll in these uh, conferences to pursue my own personal education, as well as introducing me to conferences I've never even heard about because they think that it would be a good way to really expand my, my skills or to meet other people who are in a similar position as I am. What conferences uh, have you attended? So recently I've attended the uh, Orthopedic Trauma Association uh, conference. Actually, it was just a little bit over a year ago now, uh, but I found that that was a phenomenal conference to attend, uh, especially because it really does open up a lot of uh, networks. And I, there was a very specific uh, portion of it dedicated to PAs and NPs, which I found helpful. Uh, another one would be the AO, um, basic fracture course, wherein I work with uh, resident physicians and other PAs who kind of go through this boot camp-like uh, course and really get everything up to speed and review uh, current knowledge and, and approaches to, to patient care in orthopedic. Are those American or Canadian? Any advice for PA students interested in pursuing a career or an elective in ortho? I think that, um, I mean, just taking from the experiences that I've had, uh, Definitely trying to network as much as you can, meeting the right people. Uh, it, you never really know who's the right person, but always come into a rotation as if every single person you meet could potentially have a, a great impact on your career. And when you have that mindset that every single person is important, and it, you know, in many ways they are, you want to exude that same confidence uh, both in meeting them and chatting with them as well as in working with them in whatever capacity you may have as a student. And so I think uh, having that mindset definitely will make a really good lasting impression that could potentially open up a lot of gateways in the future. How do you see your practice or your role changing? Are you going to stay in ortho or, or do you take, see yourself taking more admin, more teaching, more research? So uh, my role in orthopedics here at Sunnybrook has been a little bit unique in the sense that there are always tons of quality improvement programs and, and groups that look to improve the current standard of care. And I've, I've been invited and I've been working with a lot of these groups to kind of help improve our protocols, help with the guidelines, and it's been a great experience so far. I think that's something that I'd like to continue pursuing in the future. Uh, definitely right now, as I learn more and more about orthopedics and as I uh, develop this uh, certain level of clinical gestalt, I'm very happy with uh, the, the teaching roles that I've been offered so far and will continue to do so in the future. Are you happy with your decision to become a PA? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I think that this is something that I've always, I've never taken for granted. I think this is something that I'm always grateful for because every time 
I go to work, I'm always wondering, you know, what, what is it that I can do to make you know, the lives of my patients better? And in many ways, it's really humbling to see that there's so many people who, who come in through the fracture clinic, patients that I've seen multiple times previously, both as an outpatient and as an inpatient, and to see how much they've improved, I think that there's a certain level of, of satisfaction that you just can't get from any other profession. And the PA role is still new here in Canada. How often do you get asked, what is a PA, and what do you usually say in response? Oddly enough, I haven't actually had a lot of people ask me, what is a PA? Oftentimes when I introduce myself as a physician assistant, I think based, I mean, it's definitely a bit of a bias just because I work in a facility that employs uh, well over a dozen PAs currently, and so there is that certain level of exposure. Um, but the, the few that I do run into that aren't really sure what a PA is or aren't really sure my scope and my, my role, I try to you know, simplify it as best as I can. Now, I, I think that in many ways, I really advocate for myself as being a, a part of the patient care team, as part of the surgical team. Um, but I do emphasize that I am a physician assistant. This is what I do. I'm here to help you. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And oftentimes they're just happy to, to have someone there who's, who's keen on helping them and to really expedite their care as best as possible. Because these are patients who unfortunately have had to suffer through these long wait times and not being able to have that timely access to care that we're trying to address. Those were all my questions, but I wanted to ask you a few questions about the conference. Of course. So, did you attend the workshops on the first day? I did not attend the workshops because I did teach a workshop. So I'm part of the Stop the Bleed group here at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Uh, so if, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a group that um, really, it is more of an advocacy effort that kind of came about because of the Sandy Hook shootings back in 2012. And it's a way for us to better prepare the general public with the ability to, to stop bleeding because it is a life-saving measure, uh, not that dissimilar to CPR in many ways. And so we want to make it as accessible as possible. So uh, Christy invited myself and a few others to teach this course. And I think it's been uh, phenomenal, uh, both to teach uh, other healthcare providers to be instructors themselves, and just to, to meet these healthcare providers who definitely have a lot of expertise and. Uh, we're actually able to show me a couple of things that uh, I didn't know about uh, with Stop the Bleed. So it's been a great experience. Excellent. And this is your first PA conference, right? This is my first PA conference. So That's right. what's the experience like meeting other practicing PAs in Canada? It's been good, actually. I, I didn't really know what to expect because I always found that this is still such a small profession by all comparisons. And to see you know, well over 200 people here in the same building who are very in a similar position as myself with their profession and are just looking for ways to, to meet other PAs and to, to learn more about the, the different uh, aspects of medicine that really, you know, it's been a, a great experience overall. Mm -hmm.